Welcome, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started here in a moment. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I now call to order this meeting of the Assembly Rules Committee of the Whole. It is Thursday, September 29, 2022. This is a special meeting, and we are scheduled from 1 to 3 p.m. today. Any documents um, for this meeting are yeah. available. I think right now it's just the agenda, are available at muni.org slash work sessions. We'll go ahead and start with assembly member introductions for the record. Cameron Perez Verdia. Pete Peterson. Jamie Allard. Kevin Cross. Meg Zalatel. Suzanne LaFrance. And on the phone, we have Mr. Solt. Randy Solt. Thank you. Anyone else on the phone? Okay. Ms. Quinn Davidson uh, will be a few minutes late as will um, Mr. Rivera and Mr. Constant is here somewhere. Um, we also have members of our team in the room. We'll go ahead and go around with introductions so um, folks on the phone know who's here. Claire Ross, Legislative Liaison. Sorry. <laughs> Barbara Jones, Municipal Clerk. And also Shelley Routon with Assembly Council's Office. Okay, um, moving on to reports. I just have a few quick things to go over and we are joined by Mr. Constant. First of all, thanks to the team for, I feel like we've had a few extra meetings this week. Thank you for your support and hard work. Congratulations to Allie as well on their new addition. I wanted to make sure that members had seen the email from Margot Bellamy, the ASD regarding the memo 30 sale of surplus property concerning the portable buildings. Um, there's an email with an attachment that went out to members earlier today also wanted to let folks know that the ad hoc equity committee will now be a regular assembly committee. The assembly equity committee with Mr. Perez Rudia or Cameron and Felix as co-chairs. Also wanted to let members know that assembly leadership last month or the month before asked the board of ethics along with Mr. Peterson, who is the chair of the ethics and elections committee to review the questions that we ask to determine if a member has a substantial financial or private interest in something that comes before the assembly. There's been general and ongoing feedback that the questions are really hard to understand. I agree with that. So we will be getting some information hopefully in the next week or so and I'll share what we learn with all of you. And then a note on boards and commissions. I will be asking representatives of boards and commissions to come and address us briefly in the rules committee so that we can start to hear from some of these folks who are volunteering their time and they can give us an update or um, talk a little bit about what they're doing. We may start with the Youth Advisory Commission and the Arts Advisory Commission, for example, and that'll be in forthcoming rules committee. So if, if any of you have suggestions for boards or commissions, you know, you'd like to hear from, and these would be just fairly brief um, overview discussions, or if there's something um, that they want to brief the assembly on. 
And just a note too, to um, members to be careful in participating in, in boards and commission meetings as we're not ex officio members and the ethics code has specific rules for elected officials appearing on behalf of private interests before municipal boards and commissions. The code says, elected, quote, elected officials may appear to have the ability to exercise undue influence, end quote. And that section is AMC 1.15070. And I encourage any members who are unsure about your role to talk with Dean or Megan Carmichael in the Department of Law. Or you can also request an advisory opinion from the Board of Ethics. And then, oh, I'll go to you and right after this, I just wanted to note too, based on Tuesday's meeting, there may be some items for discussion today here that members want to bring up. And when we get to the section on um, pending business, because we're going to spend some time talking about the laid on the table items, I would just ask that members bring them up then. Mr. Constant? Thank you. And uh, that conversation about MC 115.070 relating to undue influence of members on proceedings of boards and commissions. <clears throat> the only thing I've really seen happen with that over the years, and it's been a long time, is members of the assembly have been excluded for having a conflict of interest on an item that comes before the body for deliberation on a determination of the membership that the person has a conflict because their personal interest exceeds their ability to perform their duties. And so that's just the way it could happen. Um, it's been a long time. Thank you, Mr. Constant. I want to note that we were joined by Ms. Quinn Davidson at 110. Okay, we'll go ahead and continue on with the reports. And um, Claire, is there anything that you want to report or talk about? Sure, I don't have too much today since Ali and I gave a pretty big presentation at the last rules meeting. Uh, one thing I'm working on is some background documents on some of the more complicated subjects that you're working on. Um, I just put out, just about done with a budget 101 fact sheet um, for the budget and finance committee to use about what the schedule is, how the process works, how people can get involved and how they can understand the documents. I'm also working on one that's a summary of the FEMA reimbursements from the earthquake and COVID. Of, um, and with these documents, I'm doing a lot of, um, Shelly's been helping me, but documenting the resolution or legislation that enabled it so that you all have a handy list of where to go back to if you need more information. So I'm doing that with the FEMA. Desiree's been helping me with that. Um, I'm also doing one on homelessness and how different funds that have gone to different um, housing and homelessness projects over the years that Shelly has been helping me with. And then I am helping the Safe Routes to Schools Committee get up and running. So that's what I've been working on the last few weeks. Thank you, Claire. Any questions for Claire? Okay, then we will move on to the report from the municipal clerk. Barbara? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a role today under new business. Um, and so I will defer a uh, report to talking to you then. Thank you, Barbara. Any questions from anyone? All right, we will go ahead then and move on. Just to note that um, thanks to Chris here, we have a, our slightly revised agenda that has the unfinished business next and then the new business. So we'll start with the unfinished business. And um, Dean, I don't know if you have anything that you want to report regarding the potential lawsuit and the issue of the BSA education funding. I know it, uh, I believe where we left it last time was you were expecting um, a report from ICER. Oh, um, what I would call is, uh, I'm not sure which was comedy meeting, but the last time I reported on it was a uh, I got a message from the ICER executive director that they hadn't received, um, well, they had some communication with the legislative council. And excuse me if I'm misnaming anything in particular, but uh, there was a funding request, but then no funding materialized, so they had no project. So ICER is not doing anything for initiating a study of the district cost factors and how they should be adjusted or whether they should be adjusted. Um, the last time they were adjusted in the state statutes, 2013. 
So um, it's a bit overdue, of course, as we all know. I think maybe the um, piece that is, or the loose end, I suppose, in this request is uh, if there's no legislative solution and without the ISA report, I don't see one materializing, but it's a great thing to put on the legislative program from the assembly for um, uh, lobbying and you know, to, uh, you know, do the district cost factor study, get it changed. That's the best approach. But if there's no legislative solution, um, there has been litigation in the past. I don't know about Alaska, but in Wyoming and other states. But um, my initial report was who's the proper plaintiff for some kind of litigation over um, the disparity in the district cost factor and uh, that how inequitable it is to Anchorage as opposed to uh, as compared to other school districts in the state. Um, but it seems that either the Anchorage school district or um, a group of parents of children who are adversely affected by uh, the funding or lack of funding, or lack of fair share of funding, uh, would be proper plaintiffs for that kind of lawsuit. But I think the end is perhaps the municipality could be a plaintiff as a representative of the taxpayers who are required to fund the required local contribution for the state's formula. Right. But I need a little more research on that. If the municipality really is a proper plaintiff there, I think that um, I would be looking at the lawsuits I mentioned that have occurred in other states and the plaintiffs were. But I think they're like uh, invariably, usually the school district that brings the lawsuit against the state for its state's funding formula. That's why I don't think the municipality is the proper plaintiff as compared to the school district or uh, parents of students, but um, I would, if you wanted to keep it up for that last little bit, <laughs> I would try to get that research done, perhaps um, farm it out to our contractor. Thanks, Dean. We Oh, go ahead, Meg. Thank you. So I appreciate the update. I think where I would like to see this item go is into a legal memorandum of what roles, if any, the municipality may have to play in the BSA funding, what that might look like, um, and um, any advice <clears throat> provided around that. Um, it feels like something that's kind of just lagging on a bit. And so the question becomes, you know, do we have I mean, whoever's item this is, who's interested in this, is there some timing associated with it that you would want to be having Dean explore possible legal intervention prior to another opportunity to look at this? Because we could look at whether or not we should sue over the BSA forever. But the question is, is there, is there an actionable time in which you're really wanting to press it forward? Um, for a little clarification, you said the BSA, you mean the base student allocation, and uh, this has nothing to do with the base student allocation, and I don't think the municipality or school districts have any role there. It's the state statute sets a number. The base student allocation is part of the school funding formula. This is the district cost factor, which is another part of that formula, and Anchorage is the baseline, but the baseline adjusts over time. Yeah, um, I understand been, that. Yeah. Um, okay. It's just what the item says on the agenda. It's fun. It's termed BSA. Oh, yeah. So I think we're using uh -huh. that a little bit as shorthand um, uh for this. But whether or not the municipality has the potential to bring claims as to its contribution or its contribution limits, I think is a question that could you could possibly memo up so that it could get resolved. And then whoever was interested in this particular route could kind of get back to us on how they feel about whatever the advice is and if they want to have us consider something more and what that timing might be. Yeah, and um, it's of course a reasonable request. I might suggest a different approach to it though. Um, I apologize, I had changed when I first did a PowerPoint presentation on this question. I changed that subject title to um, just from cost factor, but uh, I guess in the agenda, it stayed the same in BSA. Anyways, um, I might suggest a different approach, and that would be inviting um, Dr. Mark Stock, who's 
uh, the dual school district because he's like the subject matter expert on this whole issue and has experience from other jurisdictions to speak to. I, I don't want that at this point, frankly. I want legal okay. advice on whether there are claims or not, because that is the potential lawsuit. So is there potential legal claims for the assembly or the municipality to bring? That's the only question I'm interested in answering at this point. Um, um, there's no legal claim for the assembly to bring. There might be for the municipality, and we can work on a legal memo for that. And you're not asking about the school district or parents, just the municipality that has legal claims based on the taxes. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Meg. And are there any members here who are interested in taking the lead on working on this issue or want to be a part of that? I know it came up in our joint meeting with the school board last week, and uh, my interpretation was a reiteration of wanting to work together to pursue this issue. And I am just curious if there are any members here. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I am <clears throat> happy to proceed. And I think Meg asked for a pretty straightforward item. And Dean, it can be through the contractor, like you suggested, which would be to draft a legal brief of the landscape of the question, A, what's the municipality's role? And B, what's a path using litigation to um, at, raise the question of the fairness of the current district cost factor. And so I think just a straightforward memo could be from Bill or others that lays this all out for us in writing. So then we can make a, a step based on a concrete position as opposed to an ongoing soft talk about what we might do. Is that a fair summary? Thanks, Chris. And maybe by November. Oh. November sounds okay. okay. Okay, thanks. Kevin? And I guess the last question on that is as, uh, as Mr. Gates start opened, if it were to proceed legally, who the best plaintiff would be? Would that be a PTA, the parent teachers, teacher, parents, would it be the ASD or the Muni? Because that's the final question is, which one gives us the greatest amount of leverage? Pete? Thanks, Suzanne. And I just wanted to point out that the last year I was in the legislature, we, we talked about this in the Education and Early Development Budget Subcommittee, that there needed to be a study. And that was 2012. So this is not a new issue. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on. The second item, Anchorage School Board Assembly Working Group to address the dangerous street crossings on school routes. Um, the working group had its first meetings last Friday, and I believe Kevin and Daniel and Randy were all there. Any of you want to add anything else? I know we heard a little bit about it last Friday. Uh, yes. Um, you know, it was a, it was a very productive meeting. Um, the Anchorage School District uh, has several different um, organizations within them that deal with traffic and high hazard traffic. So this was a real uh, nice opportunity to get everybody in the room and culminate. So the next process now is to identify and go back and talking to principals and identify the hot spots and what are the top 10. We recognize that every district is going to have dangerous situations that's been created by additional traffic at the schools and lack of uh, school bus transportation. However, certain situations um, are much more dire than others. And since we can't solve everything with a broad brush, we have to be specific in targeting those things that are of the greatest health issues first. And so we're in that process now of going through and then understanding what complicates those. You would think it's really easy. It's just more traffic. But sometimes it's complicated with construction that's taking place in the area or maybe it intersects with a state highway. And so there's no legally you can't put a crosswalk there. And how do we deal with these things? And so as much as I would like to think that, you know, just putting up traffic guards and slowing things down would be the easy and appropriate response. It oftentimes is more complicated than that. Um, but, uh, and also, you know, as far as expanding school zones, slowing down traffic in the area. So right now we're going through, we've collected information, identifying the hot spots, and next progress in the next meeting will be more on what are the specific actions we can take in those definitive areas. Great, thank you. And Claire, you're helping to 
uh, coordinate and staff that working group as well. Okay, great. Anything else? We will go ahead then and move on to the new business. Assembly Council and Municipal Clerk regarding laid on the table items, et cetera. Okay, did I succeed already? <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Zalatel. So I think we can skip to page two, please. Um, page, page two is what con concerns you, and I think you know some of the other stuff. Um, as you know, uh, late on the table items are not favored, and I understand that um, it did come up at your meeting that maybe laid on the table is a problem in general. Maybe the procedure that we've developed isn't working. All I'm doing is implementing it. So, um, but this is a couple of the reasons I have to, to let you know, and Mr. Solt actually brought one of them up. You know, the public has no advance notice. They're not available because we don't have any way to post them. Um, and Mr. Solt commented that assembly members have literal or no time to review them. You know, my concern is, of course, selfish. We talked a little bit about the assembly's records, and the clerk's office is worried that we're going to make a mistake in your records because they're laid on the table. So, e even so, we know that they're inevitable. So here is what happens if somebody has a late on the table item to submit. And we just have a list here. Don't submit an on, on base email to the agenda team that they're not numbered, which again, I think contributes to your confusion, our confusion, the public's confusion at the meeting, because the item is referred to the unnumbered laid on the table procedure for laid on the table items. It's, it's confusing. Um, and then we ask people to prepare 25 copies and bring them by 445. So we do have a note here that if they're there by 445, then the chair reads them into the agenda and they're incorporated into your agenda. If they come after 445, um, I've kind of detailed the procedure somewhere else in here, but what it means is that you've approved your consent agenda and now you're adding something else to it. Technically, you should reconsider the consent agenda, lay the new item on the table, re-vote on the consent agenda. So I'm just letting you know that we really want people to get them at 445. Sorry. Go ahead, Meg. Thanks. I want to make sure I track that. So if it's not at 445 and it comes later, is that when you're saying that you would have to go through that three-step process on reconsidering the consent agenda? Technically. Oh. Now, remember, that doesn't apply to supplemental items or AOs or ARs for introduction. It applies to consent agenda items if you wanted to take action on them that night. So, you know, um, you know, we're going to do some Robert's Rules gymnastics and, you know, move to suspend the rules. We're probably going to find some other mechanism to get that item laid on the table for you. But we're just letting you know the process that you have set up to approve the agenda and approve the addendum and the laid on the table items includes the chair reading those into the record at the beginning of the meeting. But if we miss that opportunity and then the item comes up on its own because its numbering would put it in 
this is why it is, right? Because it's numbering, because of the type of item would put it in the consent agenda. That's why you're saying technically we should do this route. Got it. That was the piece I was missing. I appreciate that. So again, I, I hope that was sufficiently boring that, um, so again, it's an example for why this is not, these are not favored procedures. Um, the, the, at the bottom of the page, um, in item number five, for those of you who are on the phone, you know, we send you an email and the email has three asterisks, urgent, and three asterisks. And we're doing that so that we know your emails are overwhelming. And that way, at if you're on the phone at the meeting, you can just sort by the asterisks or urgent, and then those items are going to pop up in your email. The code does say that um, it authorizes members to participate on the phone, but it says you have to be able to see and hear the items. So, you know, we want to make sure that we have those items for you. Um, and then the rest of this, the next page is the procedure for the chair. You know, the general procedure is in number C at the top of page four, but then there's the special procedure at number D. And you can all just ignore that. But I just wanted to let you know that it's not um, it's not simple. It's not simple for you. It's not simple for the chair or the clerk's office. And then back to the front page, we really are encouraging people to um, submit the documents by the agenda deadline. I did work with um, Mr. Gates on this and... You can see in the second bullet in B, Assembly's Council's office was asking you to submit several days before the agenda deadline if you have an S or S1. And then he said if you have a conceptual ordinance, you should um, submit at least one month. And um, we're, we're just asking um, for your help um, I think the clerk's office and legislative um, services are doing more drafting and we're all trying to chip in and help. Um, but we just want you to make sure that um, we can't turn things around um, without a little. And, and, you know, one of the most important things, you know, I, I will say we are pretty good, <laughs> but um, we want your input on what we've drafted and, and rarely are we going to draft something for you and you're going to approve it as drafted. So um, this gives us all more time to make sure that your documents are as accurate as possible. And, and that is all I have on laid on the table items. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. And Barbara, this process here pertains to regular meetings. Yes, that is correct. Okay, any questions, comments? Kevin? I'm just thinking, you know, the difficulty primarily with delayed on the table, page two here states clearly why delayed on the table items are uh, a difficulty. Primarily when typically at the assembly meetings, we're getting all these last minute amendments, things are popping up, and we're sitting here already at the dais processing all those sorts of new disclosures or things are getting moved around. You know, there's always that, that first 15 minutes, which is not, which is uh, not, you know, just there's a lot of motion. And then to add late on table items and to have to go through them. I almost feel as if late on table items that like, I, you know, should be limited to a certain size and scope. And beyond that, like, are we realistically doing the public a service? Are we able to digest it if it's, three or four pages, or if it's, it should be, I would think other than the emergency situations is they should be short and succinct and intentional, uh, not to add additional burden to our ability to comprehend and digest them so that we have good legislation. Um, and not just in volume and the size of them, but the magnitude. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely something to take into consideration, but you know, all your, but what's funny is I look at the late table items and I see that 
that we do the same thing with existing things with too many amendments. And by the time something comes through the blender on the other side, it doesn't look like what it was going in. And so you can take every one of these laid on the table items and instead of put LOT, replace it with amendments. And it increases the likelihood of mistakes for final legislative, multiple last minute amendments, lack legal items are. And so whenever we change, whether what it is in our tape or legislation that's before us, we got to be intentional and we got to be slow. I mean, that's where it has to be slow about how much we're changing what we're doing at the last minute. And there's and done hastily is where we make mistakes. So thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Next is Chris, then Meg. So I participated in the process of developing these policies or this kind of guidance. And <clears throat> I am of both minds on this, that yes, as we try to practice limiting laid on the table items to businesses that really has to pass or even when you put it in context of amendments, number of amendments, magnitude of amendments, et cetera, that it's a member's right to move anything that they want, whenever they want. And I do have a struggle with the balance between the, the point of trying to be orderly and make sure it's all correct and efficient and cause as little pain as possible along the way and being prepared when a moment comes to address an issue that's important in the time within the rules. And so I am not one who easily will give up the authority or right to make a motion or make an, an effort to lay something on the table that needs that I determine it needs to be. The check on that is six other members of the assembly plus and an agreement that we come to on the softer side, that is, we generally don't want to do this, or we set up that bar that has become pro forma to get things on the table. So from where I sit, I respect the need to do this and at the same time reserve the right. So I've got Meg next, and then I'll come back to you, Kevin. Thanks. Um, so for the timing part of laid on the table, you know, I appreciate the clerk um, included the code section in here. And really, I mean, it's three instances, financial necessity, natural disasters, or when time is of the essence. What I would love to see is a cover or a, a memorandum that goes with any laid on the table item explaining how it meets this code section and what what got in your way? What circumvented the normal process? Because I feel like the explanations we get on the dais aren't sufficient, particularly when it comes to appropriations. Um, so I would really like to see that. And I would like it to be a part of the written record, why we went from particularly appropriations laid on the table to decision in the same night. What necessitated that, that there was no advanced public notice? Um, so it's something that I will just pass on to leadership to consider. Um, you know, I think in particular resolutions are a little bit different. A lot of times the resolution in and of itself kind of explains why it's being laid on the table because some, there's been an intervening event since the time of the dead, the addendum deadline. Um, but it's when we're being asked to do, um, to spend money really, really fast, it feels like. And that's where, you know, you don't even get the time to go check the fund certification or inquire with Desiree, like, you know, is this right or whatever, because you literally have it in the moment. Um, and I think I find that frustrating. And I find that we get a lot of those and we're told we have to pass them. Um, so it really feels like our hands are tied. Um, and I'm going to have to leave this meeting. So um, thanks. I'll be interested to come back and listen to the rest of the discussion. Thanks, Meg. So I've got Kevin, and did someone else raise a hand over here? And then Randy, and then you, Chris. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, I just want to, you know, I, I agree with what Chris said. And let's also remember that we vote on whether or not we accept the laid on the table items. And it is it is our right to set a higher standard. I think what we've done really is that we've just been wanting to get business done. And for the purposes of it, we realize we got a full schedule and we're adding these things um, out of kindness and consideration because, but maybe we need to amongst ourselves here, decide if we need to increase that standard and, and, and require uh, 
a higher commitment to meaning, making sure these things are done in a timely manner so we're not stuck, you know, uh, with these last minute large item considerations uh, and then having to explain ourselves later. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Randy? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I agree with Chris and Kevin. Um, you know, the minimum we accept is the maximum we're going to get. And when I came on to the assembly, my approach was was vote no on every laid on the table item, just um, as as Barbara and I have talked, and and just last minute rush. I don't have time to prepare for it. Um, so I would encourage again to vote no. And then also, uh, I don't know if anyone's there from the administration, but it does seem like we do get a lot of last minute requests from the administration and they need to do better. And if they don't, they're gonna find that I think this body will start saying no to those laid on the table items. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. I'll go to um, Jamie next and then you, Chris, since Jamie hasn't spoken yet. Thank you, and I, I agree that we just, we need to just say, say no. We've said it over and over time and time again. Did I? I prefer to listen to the public. One thing, though, that I, I would mostly vote yes on when it's laid on the table, there are incidences of um, individuals who have either passed away or be recognized because of a major sporting event. I think we can all agree that that's something that's of value, that sometimes we want to do it sooner than later to recognize them at that, that top moment of their lives or their accomplishments. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Next is Chris. Thanks. So I was trying to think about the suggestion of a memo requirement. And practically speaking, working furiously till the last minute to get the resolution drafted. And now you have to draft a memo to go with it, right? It actually doesn't, it may not achieve the goal that it's intending to. So just thought on that. And again, I think it just needs to be a commitment continuously reiterated to limit these items. Um, and the policy as it's being kind of shifted is fine, but just there are those times when action has to happen. Thanks, Chris. Um, I guess I will just add that balance of getting the work done and recognizing on the administration side, sometimes what appears to be the last minute is actually a culmination of a lot of work that doesn't make the deadline. And I know like we had on Tuesday um, an item that was to be laid on the table. You know, it didn't, it didn't have unanimous support for laying it on the table. And at the time, you know, some other members recognized that, no, we need to start enforcing a higher standard. And I think Meg's point, especially when it comes to appropriations, um, is one that is especially when they're, we've seen some pretty high ones come through. So anyway, I'm just recognizing that at times, um, as you all have said, there's a need for flexibility. I like the idea of the cover letter, but also that could make the late on the table item even later. Um, so, okay. Um, I had, there was another note someone mentioned. If I think of it, I'll come back to it. Um, Okay, anything else then on this on this topic? Madam Chair. I can switch to the next topic. Okay, sure. so I'm gonna really bore you now. Okay. Um, so uh, this topic, this topic is is even more boring than laid on the table items. It includes substitute, alternate documents, and corrections. And so part of why I'm letting you know about this is because um, some of you do substitutes, which is fine, but rarely do does the assembly branch do alternate or corrections. But we just have a procedure and I wanted I work for you and I want to make sure that you're aware of it. So substitutes are on the front page, and I think we all get a substitute. You know, it's the, the rules for a substitute is use legislative drafting. The info is on the front page there about, about what that means. I think page two, we're talking about where we have a couple of code issues that we need to clarify. And so item B specifies that if you have a substitute, 
the code requires you to have a new AM explaining the differences in the substitute. So, um, Mr. Krause, if I could use you as an example, I know that you had um, the AO on the table that um, concerned um, the, a vacancy. And so when you introduce a substitute, you're making some changes to that. You have to have an AM that says, I changed this and I changed that. Super simple. But when you submit the substitute, you submit the new AM and the clerk's office is going to assign it a number. But you also submit the original AM because the original AM might be pretty dense and it might say this ordinance is being proposed because of all of these reasons. That's not in the new AM. Both of those AMs go together and make up the legislative history of that document. Remember, the assembly is, let's say they pass the S. If they pass the S and the new AM and not the original AM, we lose that legislative history. So um, I just wanted to point that out to you. That seems to be a misunderstanding. Sometimes people submit um, an AMS, the code is clear that substitutes are for ordinances, A's are for AMs. Here you're submitting a new AM. I just want to make sure that that's, that's really clear. And let me um, just pause you one yes. second, Barbara, to note that we've been joined by Mr. Rivera. <laughs> so again, since we're making Anchorage really boring, um, about three quarters of the way through page two, I have a little master class note. And so that note is telling you that there may be occasions where, you know, you have two AMs. You know, one member who was a sponsor may have submitted an AM with the original ordinance, but another member may want to submit an AM that says, this is my opinion of this ordinance. That is okay. But I just wanted to let you know that's a little different than the substitute. But it's okay to do that. It's just not, we just don't see it very often. So then I want to talk about alternates. Again, the assembly doesn't do alternates very often, but you might. And so, and of course, you'll see them. So the general rule is that you use an A or an alternate with AMs. So like contracts, amendments to contracts, appointments, you know, we have seen that. So the one thing that's really important is you should never see an AMA standing alone by itself. Remember, it's just like an S. It, it's a child. It, it doesn't... <laughs> right? It, it isn't, um, it isn't, it can't stand on its own on your agenda. So if you see that, you should probably ask, and we probably made a mistake putting that on the agenda. So on the third page, we're letting people know, if you have an alternate, use legislative drafting marks. So um, I have a couple of examples. One um, AMA that we had, someone's title was wrong. And we had the AMA in front of us. We had the AM and the AMA. And I read it and I read it again and I could not figure out what the difference was. So um, um, through Dean, we asked Shelly to review it. Someone's title in the SIG block. You no, know, and I just, of course, you know, when you're reading, I just missed that. So that's an example of why you want legislative drafting marks. If you're an assembly member and you've got an AM and an AMA on the agenda, you can look at the AMA with the, you know, strike throughs or the brackets, and you can see exactly what was changed. Um, the other thing is if you see an AMA and an AM on the agenda, and somebody doesn't pull it, 
please think of pulling it because we had an instance where both were approved. We didn't know, you know, it, it was submitted by the administration and, and we should have noticed it, but we didn't. And they both got approved. So there's an approval to purchase a DC-9 and an approval to purchase a DC-10. So those both got approved. Now, Dean has explained the later approved one is the one that controls, but we just don't want that in your legislative history. So that's interesting, the later approved one. So when I think about that, so would you think that if you had an AM and then an AMA, and they both pass in the same vote, then that the AMA would be the latest passed one because it's subsequent in the alphabet? You, you know, I think that's a great question. Is it the mother that got approved and the child was second? Or is it the A that was, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> For those on the phone, there was a look from Mr. Gates. Uh, well, I'm not really sure of the answer either, but I do apply the rules of um, statutory or construing statutes and stuff, and that's what they are. Is, uh, the one later in time will give one over the uh, one that's later. I mean, one more recent in time, one more recently passed will give one if there's a conflict there. And that's really the uh, cleanest way to resolve a conflict. I don't know if you could say the first one and the second one. And for the first one, because it's the mother or whatever, but the one that last passed, I mean, same vote and everything, uh, everything being equal, I think it's the timing that we really can burn. Again, Dean, the problem is with the timing, say 10A passes in the consent agenda and it's AM 2022-01 and AMA pass at the same time on the same vote. This is like super deep noodling into parliamentary procedure. It's not, this is not very germane, but that's the question. Like what happens if they both pass on the same vote? How do you make a determination which one is subsequent? Oh, and at the same time, you said, uh, um, that's something where we should probably bring it back before the body to resolve yeah. the issue. Yeah, yeah. And so then you move to the reconsider the item and then pick up the one that matters if you noticed if it was in time, mm -hmm. then get, gets us to the correction, maybe. Okay, I hope that was um, challenging and got everybody's thinking caps on. So um, the next rule applies to corrections. So um, what I want everyone to know about corrections is corrections would be for documents that are, that need a correction and they're not on the same agenda. So the rules for corrections are you got to contact the municipal legal department or assembly council. You know, we don't want submitters, even the clerk's office, um, making corrections. And um, for those of you who, who may recall, we had conforming amendments that you've made to the budget or to Title 28, the elections code. And, you know, we sent those to the sponsor um, and said, you know, and we also send them to assembly council, did we capture the conforming amendments right? And if you remember in the elections code, those are in red, the conforming amendments that we made so that that's preserved for the history. You know what corrections we made. And the title of the document now is um, AO 2021-110, as amended with conforming amendments. That is the new title of that document. So we've preserved that record. Similarly, what you want is if there's a correction, the title of the document should be, let's say it's the AR 2022-1 as corrected. Corrected becomes part of the title. And there's a couple of reasons for that. That original document may have circulated, it may have been um, signed and circulated. So we wanna make sure that we now have a different document. Um, 
The other thing that's really important, you know, I've, I've talked about how submitters shouldn't make the corrections, but if you're making a correction, so let's say we've gotten legal approval to do that, and you're at the bottom of page three of four, um, the rule which Dean has shared with me, Dean and I and Quincy Arms in um, Muni Legal worked on these, um, the correction can only happen if the document hasn't taken effect or been implemented, and Dean can give you the um, case that has that information. The next thing is, is you have to use the same number because if you if you just submit another number, we're going to end up with a, a DC-8 that you own and also a DC-10. You know, we're going to have two documents that say the same thing. And you don't know that the DC-10 substituted for the DC-8. So um, then on the top of page four, we're again reminding people to use legislative drafting. And then that way, the assembly knows what was corrected in those documents, whether it's someone's title or the piece of equipment that was changed. Um, but whatever that is, that's important for you when you see this corrected document. It's sort of like you said, Kevin, when you get to the meetings and you're reading this volume of documents, well, if you have a contract amendment that you're reviewing to approve and it's corrected, well, what's being corrected? Is it a simple clerical matter and I can just move on and focus on something else? Or is it something really important that I need to review more? So that's important that I need to review more. So that's why legislative drafting is important. Then we also want people that are submitting corrected documents to include a new section that tells us what to do. They want, they need to tell the assembly and the public and the whole wide world that that old document regarding the DC-8 is replaced, right? Or the old document with the wrong person's title is replaced. And then the clerk's office notes how to maintain your records. We just write replaced with this and then the file ends up being the new document with the old one attached. And then when someone searches the public portal for those documents, that's what they get. So it's really important to keep your legislative history correct. So the, the next section is, as Dean would say, my least favorite section of code and my least favorite motion. And this is a big, it's really difficult to rescind or amend something previously adopted. You may have to do it. But again, this is only, only happens at the direction of assembly council or the municipal legal department. We don't need to get into it, but if it happens, they'll be telling you what is going to happen. And so again, I'm really proud of myself for making Anchorage boring. The clerk's office is um, working on some of these procedures. We're going to be posting them on Muniverse so that other people have access to this information. And um, as you can see in um, the laid on the table item, I reminded people that the training that Dean provided on August 26th on legislative drafting, I've referenced that here, and that's on Muniverse as well. Go ahead, Chris. So that motion, Barbara's least favorite motion, is actually probably my favorite motion. <laughs> and um, it's probably the forbidden fruit effect that um, I think it's only been used once since I've been on the body. And that was through great resistance. And every other time it's been proposed, it has been effectively resisted. And so just that is a very, very interesting motion. <coughs> Thanks, Chris. Anybody else? This might be a good time to express appreciation for our staff. <laughs> I'm still stuck on what happens if an AM and an AMA passes and who gets to sort that out. We do. We do, but I mean it getting caught and and being brought back 
before us and whatever corrections and documentation and needs to happen. I think it's really easy to pick up the agenda and just kind of take it for granted. And the more of these kinds of conversations or to see what the staff actually have to do to ensure that things are accurate. It's like, whoa. Anybody else? Kevin, you look thoughtful. Not to put you on the spot. I feel like I'm learning to ride a bike by reading the manual. I'm just going to have to get on and ride it and figure out how to do wheelies real quick. Actually, you're in a wheelie, and then you're reading the manual. You know, by the way, I say I'm so good on a bicycle, I could do a wheelie on a unicycle. So, oh, Well, thank you so much, Barbara. I appreciate the documentation and the explanation you know, I'll just and discussion. One last thought. Go ahead, Chris. So we think of buildings and their architecture and the structures that keep a building up. This is invisible architecture and structure and engineering, and you can't touch it, but it keeps the whole thing going. And it's mm -hmm. just kind of magic and amazing. Agree. Thanks. All right, so we are on the second item of new business, assembly member discussion on pending business or update from committees. Feel free to um, do both in, when we go around. I just want to check, is there anyone who needs to leave soon? I know we already lost Meg, and I'm not sure if Jamie's coming back. Okay. Um, who wants to start? We can... Go around the table. You want to, Chris? I Go ahead. I don't, I don't have anything big to announce, but I wanted to get into the flow of the committee, maybe under the unfinished business for the next meeting, um, the planning for that working group between the assembly and the school board planning the youth meeting for probably early next year. So mm -hmm. um, I just want to get that a place on the agenda so it doesn't drop. It becomes more and more clear as we go. Thanks, Chris. Kevin? Um. <clears throat> working on a lot of things, uh, mostly title, uh, title 21, um, code changes and alterations. Um, so the next several CEDC meetings should be very uh, informative as well as some parking minimums, some stuff that we were working on, which by the way, uh, Volan's not here, but he's been uh, working really hard on. Um, so some really good things that we're working on in order to create you know, make it easier for contractors, make it easier for homeowners to provide affordable housing. So we're dealing with the um, the code compliance issue that's complicated some of our housing issues. And there is one more thing I want to make sure I get on the record that, I may, that we're all aware of. And, and I really appreciate Meg bringing this to our attention. Um, many of you may be aware of the uh, trailer park that's in Chugiak that's had issues. Um, that's been something we've discussed. Well, um, it, it has now come down. It is now a uh, time that they are required to relocate. And unfortunately, although relocation assistance was offered to everybody, very few residents actually took it up. And so now we're, we're dealing with an emergency here. And so, and I may be calling on some of you to try to help us out. We've got over a hundred individuals that suddenly thought that maybe the bureau bureaucracy would just, or the problem would just kind of solve itself if they just sat long enough but unfortunately did not. And we're approaching winter. And as you know, they're on temporary water. Uh, the whole situation is a pretty dire concern and a mess. And now uh, on top of our homeless population, we are looking at adding over 100 people or 48 different families uh, to that in a short amount of time. So that is something I'll be jumping on immediately once I leave this meeting. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Pete? Thanks, Suzanne. Um, well, the issue of relocatables was referred to the Community and Economic Development Committee, and uh, I expect we'll be having that on our agenda for our next committee meeting. Probably all could be with some additional items. We've uh, you know, the the head of that department was uh, reassigned to a new position, and so there's a new person in charge of the Community and Economic Development. And so I'm not, I haven't got uh, a memo from him yet as to what items he might want to have on our next agenda. And uh, then uh, the Ethics and Elections Committee, we had our monthly meeting yesterday, uh, went over uh, changes and amendments to Title 28, which is something that we do regularly uh, 
after elections to to tidy some things up and uh, and we also had an introduction uh, from Kevin uh, yesterday on his uh, I think it's uh, 202277 right. and uh, there will probably be could be getting additional information about that uh, going forward and um, I, I think that's all I've got right now thanks thanks Pete Felix Thank you, Madam Chair. Homelessness. Thanks. Got it. <clears throat> Thanks, Felix. Cameron? Uh, let's see. Well, one thing um, that it's important for people to know, the, um, the development of the body camera policy has taken another setback they have um the, the union has and the union and the apd have not come to an agreement and it's been referred to arbitration um so that will be um announced and discussed in the Pu public safety committee next week um also, that uh, appreciate the announcement about the Equity Advisory Committee. Felix and I will be um, finding some time within our crazy schedules to to work on fleshing out the the processes and uh, how that's going to all work. And looking forward to the the meeting next week. Next week, yeah, next week. Um, let's see what else. Oh, just that um, um, Austin Quinn Davison and I are going to begin to work on uh, something that should have been worked on a long time ago, and that's our the, the process and policies surrounding how we name things in Anchorage. And so we'll be working with Daryl Hess on on beginning to, to, to reorient ourselves in the history of that, how that's how that uh, has worked and, and why we are where we are, and, and coming up with ideas about how to move forward in a way that um, uh, we feel like is, is more appropriate for, for our city. So that's probably good for now. Thanks. Thank you, Cameron. <clears throat> we'll go to the phone. Randy? I have nothing to add at this time, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Austin? Um, I don't think I have much to add either. Obviously, budget season is... Um, warming up so we'll be working on that but and hoping to do the same um sort of omnibus structure where members bring their amendments so we see what those are and then Forrest and I, and I try to take all of those and make a package that works to make it easier on the floor um if you all have feedback about whether we should do that or shouldn't do that um we'd be glad to take it uh yes yeah, i think that's all for now Thank you, Austin. Felix, um, Cameron, sorry. Felix Cameron. Um, my uh, my sister's name was Kathleen and my brother's name is Ken. And so my mom used to say, Kathleen. Um, um, so yes, I just wanted to respond to Austin. Yes, I, I for one, loved that process and thought it was really well done and, and, and would like to use that same process again this year. Thanks. Thank you, okay, Campleen. Cameron. Oh, go ahead, Austin. Oh no, I just I just said thanks to Campleen or Cam or whatever we're calling him. <laughs> thanks, Austin. All right, um, Chris, did you want to add something? I just hadn't heard a report from you, and but on Kevin, on your report of 100 people, I am separately um, in discussions with code enforcement on. A property in the district that has 50 residents that are on the verge of being mm -hmm. dislocated because of black mold mm -hmm. and a disastrous environment in the building and so i am aware of a similar <coughs> similarly emerging situation that could put pressure on our our system in the short order so there's probably a broader solution begging to be found but yeah it's it's mm -hmm. re getting real Thanks, Chris. I hope you both will keep us posted in our open forum, of course. 
Um, okay, so for me, I think the body is waiting for some follow up on our um, retreat discussion about housing, and Claire and I have talked a little bit about that. Haven't forgotten, still working on it, and um, hope to have some updates and some possible next steps coming soon. Um, I just wanted to to make a note on something with Robert's rules. You know that. Technically, in Robert's rules, um, to preserve decorum, there's no no back and forth really between members. Like members don't ask each other's questions. But I also recognize that um, the rules need to serve the function that we need them to serve. I'm not saying we change the rules arbitrarily, but we do have a practice sometimes of people asking a question, especially of a sponsor, and then that person responding even when they're not in the queue. And sometimes it falls apart a little bit. And so I wanted to just let members know I'm I'm aware that technically the rules say that, you know, well, any, as I understand them, as I interpret them, a member can raise a question to another member. And if that member wants to answer, they can put themselves in the queue and use up one of their two times to speak to the issue, but we have a more flexible approach. So um, I'm just mentioning that because I've seen a couple instances where it kind of um, has broken down a little bit with some back and forth. And of course, any member can at any time call a point of order if you think that that's gone too far and doesn't serve the needs of the body in a productive way. But I guess really as far as, um, Legislative stuff. I mean, I know Felix, you have been doing a lot of the homelessness um, heavy lifting, and thank you for that. But I feel like um, it's. I know I'm not working on anything specific, but it's playing. I think a big, you know, it's factoring in to what we're all working on and, and thinking about. So, but thank you for your presentations and for doing that work. I'm disappointed you don't have a presentation today. <laughs> Just kidding. I already gave a presentation today. <laughs> One per day is enough. All right. For you. <laughs> Does anyone have anything else they want to raise under new business, pending business? Sure. Go ahead, Claire. I just wanted to offer our legislative services um, support for your projects. Kevin, I was thinking especially of that Title 21 work. Um, if you need help, um, writing fact sheets or translating complicated code into stuff to educate the community members or research or um, even convening stakeholders. That's something that I could help with. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. And that, I mean, that goes for everyone's projects, but I was just thinking that one might be most applicable right now. You just d never cease to gain in value. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm half the value now though without Allie, but <laughs> I'll do my best. Well, you know, and we we had the uh, retreat where we talked about housing, and I expect that there will be, uh, you know, AOs or ARs coming from that discussion uh, that'll be in front of the Community and Economic Development Committee for additional discussion, and and before it eventually makes it on our agenda. So, uh, I'm. I'm up, just keep me in the loop on those. Thanks. Yeah, and I do attend those meetings. Um, so if you need help with me, also keep me in the loop, and I'm happy to help out with anything you need for that. And thank you, Claire, for putting together the fact sheet regarding the definitions um, related to sheltering. And that's something that um, Claire and I had talked about. At, we had talked with someone, a member of the hockey community, about some of the uh, terminology that is used in our meetings that members of the public may not be familiar with. And so that list started with terms that were on those documents, the appropriation documents um, that were before us, and then other people and other members, and I think also um, ACH provided some feedback. And at the end of the day, you know, we had a really, I think, useful reference document. So thank you, Claire, for doing that. Another example of 
the kinds of help Claire and um, and Ellie when she gets back can provide to all of us in helping to communicate with our constituents and members of the community. So thank you for that. Cameron? Yeah, just a couple things on that note. Um, one, for the for the equity advisory committee, have we decided is that is that sort of generally going to be supported by legislative services? What is the plan in terms of the the sort of staffing and support around that? One, one question, and then second question: um, the the information on our page uh, is really helpful, especially for uh, for community council meetings and and having having topics and, and references and links and all those kinds of things. When you're developing that, are you developing that in, with that in mind in terms of how often it's updated, thinking about it being on a something that's ready for that period of time that we have community councils? So just wanted to get your thoughts on that and to know that that's something that you're thoughtfully sinking. Yeah, you and I had, had talked about that, about how um, it'd be nice to have something at the end of the month that's fresh for the next month's community councils. Uh, I tried to sync our email newsletter that way, but what I found is um, it seems easier to do half in the middle of the month in between assembly meetings because at assembly meetings, I'm taking notes of what you're passing and um, and then linking it to the legislation and stuff. But I am trying to work towards providing materials um, for you all to have if you're not following every topic, but you go to a community council or other meeting that you have. Um, something. So I think the monthly newsletter is probably the best thing on that. And then the website, I just try to update. It's usually out of date and I try to remember. Um, when Allie gets back, I think the website will be updated really regularly. Yeah. And to your first question on staffing of the equity committee, Barbara and I talked and the clerk's office has capacity to staff that committee. So I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, who, who should be my, our, our contact to, to, to discuss that? Um, through the chair, um, I, I, do, I would like to take an opportunity to let all of the assembly members know that the code says the clerk provides administrative and logistical assistance to the assembly. And just as we do with late on the table items, we have a pretty extensive process for your committees and boards and commissions. And um, that means that any staff member in the clerk's office can find an agenda for any other uh, committee. And so we think it's important that those are retained in the same location. And right now, because we're different departments, Claire has a different um, you know, G drive than the clerk's office. So we're really happy to do that for you. And um, you did authorize a new person last year. We have a new records clerk. And so our, our new records clerk will figure out a way to do that. But yes, you can contact me and Jennifer and I will let you know who we're going to be assigning to be your staffer for that committee. And I know that you all have different staffers and then, you know, we have to substitute when people are gone but I really hope it's transparent to you. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to make sure happens. Sure. Now I anticipate that Allie and Claire will be very interested in the equity committee and we hope that they come, but they don't have to do the copying and the agenda and all of those types of things that the clerk's office is here for you. Great. And just, a, and we, we can talk about this more when we have our conversation, but the, the, I think that the, um, there is some intention for this particular committee to for us to um, stretch our our um, typical ways of doing things, and so uh, I want to have that conversation with you and to see where those limits are and what our, what what our ability is to 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 try to create a, a committee and an environment that's that's really works well with the community. So we, we can talk about that more through the chair we look forward to it and if claire could be part of that conversation i think she's a good stretcher too great okay anybody else have anything all right we'll go ahead and go then to audience participation can you tell if anyone is dialed in barbara Okay, so we don't have anyone in the phone on the phone, and we don't have anyone in the room. So I would say there is no one 
here for audience participation. I mean, no members of the public here in the room. I recognize you all are here. <laughs> no one here in the room to participate under audience participation. Okay, so just a final call for any anything else since we're in a publicly noticed setting and we have um, our fabulous staff here who are wonderful resources. Nope. Okay. That brings us to adjournment. Suzanne. Oh, go ahead, Austin. All I was going to all I was going to say just really quickly was to thank Claire for doing the newsletters. You know, Felix started doing one long ago that then he let Meg and I piggyback and we would try to write a newsletter. Um, he did almost all the work. <laughs> but uh, having Claire do that is so helpful. And every time I'm about to go to a community council, I take notes on my agendas, each agenda for each meeting on what big items I want to update. But then I go back to her newsletters and look at them and see if there's anything else. And oftentimes there's more detail in there. So just a big thanks um, that we're I'm using that. So in case you didn't know that, I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm so glad to hear it's of use and being used out there. And I will admit that I was on Felix's list back in the day and it was the inspiration for mine. So credit goes back to F Felix. <laughs> nice. That's a good newsletter. <laughs> Thanks, Austin. And I will notice too, or I will note that when Felix's newsletter was coming out, some of us heard from constituents saying, where's your newsletter? <laughs> <laughs> Felix does a newsletter. Where's yours? So thank you, Claire. All right. So if there are no other comments, thank you all for being here and, and for all your hard work. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. We are adjourned.